Hello, my dear friend. I'm uh, speaking to Dr. Uh, Len Fay, and he's in California, and I'm at the Carrick Institute in Cape Canaveral today. And my gosh, I've known you for 45 years. And yes. Just a blink, just a blink. So we've talked oftentimes just about our careers and about the careers of other people, but more especially about healthcare in general and uh, the chiropractic profession and other professions that use manipulation as a primary modality of treatment. Well, you've certainly seen a lot of it, and I think um, you're sometimes a little bit too modest, so people should realize what you have done for not only for the chiropractic profession, but I think the, um, the aspect of healthcare and manipulative sciences, if you would, uh, introduction and the forming of uh, motion palpation learning aspects and global inferences and really changing a paradigm of treatment, especially for chiropractors and, and for other people. So let's just do a little flashback and then we'll move up to the present. But give me a, a little bit of a window of where you were. You know, you can start about, you know, with England and Canada and CMCC, but Really what I'd like you to talk about is how you were able to take the things that you were doing in your day-to-day -day practice helping people and then transforming that into a pedagogical model, an educational model that really revolutionized the, the practice of, of chiropractic and introduced uh, manipulations like people largely had not seen uh, throughout the world when you came on that stage. Right. So give me an idea of, of what, you know, what was going through uh, Len Fay's head when you, when you had the impetus or what was the impetus to, to start teaching this motion palpation and the type of manipulations, adjustments that you had uh, found to be successful in, in your personal practice and life? Well, my driving force comes from the fact that I had rheumatic fever and didn't do very well for three months. And then a chiropractor came in, did a house call. And from that adjustment on, I made a recovery from 95 pounds back to my 157 good athlete. And uh, so I, I determined at that point that I would become a chiropractor. And uh, I went to CMCC, I spent four years listening to all kinds of nonsense and graduated knowing that nobody knew how I got better. And I thought to myself, it can't be a religious concept that above down the universal intelligence got turned on and ran around my body and put everything right. And so I, I I said to myself, I've got to do a self-study and I've got to find out what happened. And uh, I read Selye in 1961. And Selye was explaining how the sympathetic nervous system, when it got facilitated, could actually cause all kinds of diseases. And as you know, he wrote a 500 and some odd page textbook that I then went and got, and it took me a year to read it, and I had to restudy uh, chemistry, et cetera, just to understand what the heck they were doing. But when I got finished with that text, I thought to myself, we must be influencing the sympathetic nervous system. And then I moved to Europe, and I went to uh, a conference in Belgium in 62, and uh, Illy showed motion x-ray studies of dysfunction, joints that weren't moving properly. He did his manipulative procedures, he did his rehab procedures, and the patients got better, and then he re-motion studied them and showed all this phenomenal smooth movement. And uh, then I thought, oh my God, that's what we have to do. And the next day, Gilet spent the whole day teaching how to do motion palpation to feel what Illy had shown. 
two of us showed up out of 300, Ray Broom and myself. Ray Broom eventually wrote a textbook on manipulation, and I have too. And we we learned the basics, and we both were in practice, so we went back to England, and we started palpating our patients to figure out. And, you know, it only took a few visits to find out you made the wrong mistake or the wrong decision, but eventually it got to the right decision, and then patients started making dramatic responses. And I thought, oh, my God, now I kind of know what I'm doing. I just got to figure out where's the science to this. And uh, that led me to CORE, the osteopathic researcher who was studying facilitation due to spinal dysfunction. And I thought, wow, here we go. We're, we got a path. And uh, I, I came across Sato, who was showing the affrontation of a manipulation back to the brain. And the, the thing, the puzzles, the pieces all started coming. And then I was asked to form a committee or be part of a committee to create the curriculum for AECC. And uh, Ray Broom, myself, and Jim Skinner, who was a classmate of mine, who was in England, uh, we put together a curriculum where we denounced subluxation as a religious concept, the way it was being presented with this uh, universal intelligence, innate intelligence, etc., And uh, I put together a five, five things that we were doing. We were doing manipulation based on biomechanical principles. There were neurobiological mechanisms to manipulation. We were treating inflammation. There were soft tissue conditions involved. And then, according to Selyer, the stress pathophysiology could actually hinder how you responded to any therapy. So it really became a biopsychosocial model in 1963. It wasn't called that, but that's what we were dealing with, these components. And so we put together a curriculum that taught the students what they needed to know about biomechanics, inflammation, manipulation based on the biomechanical principles of adjusting around the three axes, the orthogonal axes, in a positive and negative theta direction. So the joint didn't even go, didn't just go P to A. When it came back to neutral, it then went from A to P. And it could be restricted in both or one of those directions and all three of the orthogonal axes. So one crack wasn't going to do it. You had to adjust some motion units in more than one direction. And sometimes in the old philosophy, putting it in and then taking it out again, where P to A began, then an A to P, you were doing the opposite on both on the same side. And so this, this created havoc. I mean, the chiropractic colleges had a fit when I started lecturing in the USA about this whole concept, denying subluxation as it was described originally. And uh, in my opinion, D.D. Palmer, too, he had to turn it into a religious concept so that when he got in court, no MD could say that's practicing medicine without a license. <laughs> Who, what it would say? He's interfering with God's expression in our body, right? I mean, it's just not going to happen. And I, I believe that's what, uh, and I've heard that he actually said chiropractic was a religion. So I don't know. But anyways, I, I was hell-bent on starting it, giving it some kind of framework that a, a researcher who understood the, the physiology, the neurology, like you've done with the neurology. I mean, it's just phenomenal. And uh, to me, the, the paradigm that I opened up, let people investigate with a scientific uh, approach. I well, also you know, you were doing this, uh, well, it's over 50 years ago, and 
Uh, yeah. Those sort of terms or thoughts are radical today, but over 50 years ago, they were like, you know, what are you saying? And, and so many of your, uh, of the people that admire you come from both sort of camps. You've got people that embrace a, a concept of subluxation differently than they were taught in school. Some people that don't embrace it. At, at, the, very, at the very bottom of it is, is I think, you know, when I reflect back over our 45 years, uh, you actually did something with it. So at the end of the day, there was an adjustment or that the knowledge and the diagnostics, the palpation, were somehow brought together with the result of I'm going to do this to find something and then I can do something with it rather than just, you know, quantifying for quantifying say and the adjustments that's what really just turned people's heads and and made this really a, a vibrant type of a science many people can palpate but when you can palpate and then you can do an adjustment and then you can repalpate it's like make the observation, make the intervention, make another observation and go. So you know what I'm talking about when you see people's eyes open like bigger than big when they hear an adjustment, the sound that comes from a joint that's being adjusted properly. Can you give me a little bit of uh, a turn? Because when you came back over and coming into North America and showing people these things, it was novel, uh, it was radical, it was disruptive, but there was something beautiful about it that when people put the palpation and adjustments to the test, they were getting better results with their patients. So what was that like to change people's technique or change people's practices? Well, it was very exciting because, uh, you know, I, I spent a year at CMCC and uh, there was uh, Adrian Grice who was teaching how to palpate motion. And I was teaching how to palpate the restricted motion, the fact you couldn't feel motion. And so feeling motion that's a millimeter or two or three is very hard to do. And the students were very confused. And so I came along and said, well, it's not that complicated because you can feel it should go from P to A, and it's blocked like pushing on a wall. That's that's what we're dealing with, right? It's not we're going to find do they move normally. We're trying to find if they don't move. And then once I showed them that, and then the students started to pick up on it, and then they realized adjusting became specific into the direction of those restrictions, not line of drive. Then the line of drive theory was out for them, and they stopped thinking they were adjusting a bone with the line of drive. They realized they were adjusting the joints into a direction of restriction. And then they found out they had to go in many directions in a motion unit, and then the results started to happen immediately. And so they got very excited. And it was because of their excitement that, uh, when I was asked to go to LACC for uh, uh, approval of their, their license, and uh, I met an old classmate of mine practicing in Los Angeles who had an agent. And when I explained to what I was doing, he said, oh, you got to meet my agent and we got to get you on the road teaching this in America because nobody is doing this. And so that's how MPI started. And I basically took the curriculum from AECC that I had developed over four years of teaching manipulation, palpation, and the, the philosophy of a drugless practitioner, not chiropractic philosophy, which I called philosophy. <laughs> and they, uh, And that's what happened. We started an MPI thing and about 30 chiropractors showed up and they got very excited. And within a couple of months, they were much busier. And so the agent said to me, we got to go to the place. And that's how MPI started. It was because it energy 
really looking for us that what they were doing was really they understand once you understand what you're doing and then you know how it took them many of them came five or six seminars and it took them a year or two to catch up with the literature get the skills into their hands and uh, in the meantime they were getting busier and busier and busier to this day i get invited i mean i just stayed with a chiropractor in pittsburgh a beautiful home everything wined and dined bernadette and i for three days uh just incredible and you know it's really interesting and just you know uh the philosophy and everything aside because you've got people that are you know from a very you know vitalistic camp that do your work and love it you got people that are in a different camp and there there has been a unity with the um with the things that you have done regardless of of your opinion of it or my opinion of it or whatever the, the end result is is that if you're going to manipulate joints this is a darn good technique that has just you know phenomenal sort of consequences I'd like you just to reflect a little bit when we look at chiropractic education and you came in and all of a sudden, literally, with, and without exaggeration, every chiropractor on the planet was getting the MPI um, weekly newspapers and yeah. Don Peterson, the dad, uh, was, you know, had that thing just going around. So everyone was talking about MPI the instructors at schools were starting to teach it. Yet when you came into an area or were invited to, to give a lecture and come on campus, sometimes it didn't seem that you were welcomed by the administration. I'd just like you to talk a little bit about what that was like, what it felt like and the reality of that history. Well, I couldn't understand it to be perfectly honest, how they could call themselves colleges and then the they were banning me from speaking at the chiropractic colleges, most of them. And uh, I thought, well, what's going on here? I have literature support to what I'm talking about. Biomechanics, I was recommending. I mean, they weren't even teaching biomechanics in those days. I mean, how ridiculous can you get? And I thought to myself, well, this is amazing. I mean, it must be the gurus are paying them or something's going on that uh, they don't want the students to really know what the hell is going on. And um, so I was going there with sword drawn and I was ready to cut up and do whatever I had to do. And it was very funny because Palmer sent a one of their instructors who was head of a department. And uh, he sat there and listened to his phone with earplugs for the whole day and a half. So when I got finished, I said, um, I, there's one thing I haven't taught yet. And that's the adjustment of the coccyx with an internal contact. And doctor, I won't say his name, is your technique instructor, so he can show you that on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> the earplugs came out, and everybody was laughing, and he wondered what the hell was going on. But, you know, that's kind of how I was in those days. I mean, I really couldn't understand it, and I felt that uh, chiropractors were not as busy as they should be unless they were super salesmen because they really didn't know how to predict what was gonna happen. They didn't understand SAID, the specific adaptation to an imposed demand that requires serial adjusting. They were doing serial adjusting because of sales pitches, and they didn't really know how to adjust, so that they were just repeating the same adjustments over and over instead of taking the patient through a progression to getting better. <laughs> the whole so, thing. The, uh, throughout your journey, you're still on the day-to-day -day practice of chiropractic, and you still are attracting people from around the globe to come and see you. 
down now in sunny California, but it can be anywhere, Indonesia, you, yeah. you know how to, to do things for humankind. There's a question, of course, that many people have because the types of uh, manipulations or adjustments that you do are very dynamic. They're associated with a loud crack. They're associated right. with an instantaneous change in the person, uh, many times for the better, most of the times. And they are startling. And people have the question, my God, how long is it going to take me to learn to do that? Or can I ever do that? Or, you know, I'm just a little person. Is this for big people technique? Or I'm a big person. Is this for little people technique? How do you answer that? How do you, would you suggest that a, a chiropractor be trained to learn how to give the type of adjustments, these um, high velocity, low amplitude, specific adjustments in multiplanes. How can you teach them how to do it? How long is it going to take them to do it? Can people with different body types learn how to do the adjustment and be competent? Um, what's your take on that? Well, there's really good news in this field. Uh, CMCC, a Dr. Uh, Starmer, has developed a mannequin that can measure the pretension, and then it can record the spike of the impulse thrust. And I was recorded at a little faster than 250 millisecond spike with a 25 to 30 pound pre-pressure, right? They've mimicked that. And now the student can work away and it has nothing to do with strength. If you can spit, you can impulse because it's the same, it's exactly the same, right? So what they're doing now is what I did way back in 67 when we opened AECC. I first of all taught the thrust and it's not a push, it's not a fast push, it's a very impulse, right? It's impulse, right? And it only goes a few millimeters, which is what we've recorded is the gapping that causes the crack. Now we're not exactly sure. We thought we knew what the crack was, but now they're thinking it's breaking the suction in the joint and we're back to not knowing exactly what it is. But it definitely occurs when the joint gaps. We know that for sure. And according to Sato, and he did this work many years ago, and Brian Budgel, who's uh, a researcher in the field of uh, the sympathetics and the autonomics for chiropractic, he's a chiropractic PhD, and Sato showed that when that crack occurs, there's a way bigger affrontation back to the brain than when you just do a mobilizing stretch. They're definitely therapeutically different. And now with brain mapping, that can be shown, right? You can see that spike coming huge back into the brain. And so my observations in clinic were that if I got an audible release like that, I got a better result than if I just did mobilizing. But quite often I can only mobilize for the first three or four visits before I can actually get an audible release. So it's not, uh, not therapeutic to be mobilizing, but the better therapeutic to getting that audible release. So you just have to, in my videos, I show how to train yourself to do the impulse without the mannequin. That now, 40% of the colleges have that mannequin now. They're actually training students how to do an impulse thrust. So there's good news. It is great news. And I think, you know, simulation is, is a big part of, of healthcare. I know I spent a good part of my life in the, in the sim lab up at, uh, up at Harvard. And uh, we simulate everything. If you can think of it, we can simulate it. So it's good. You were evidence-based before evidence-based is a, was a catch term. Now evidence-based is almost like complaining about Mrs. Brown having her eyes open in church and you wonder what the evidence is or who caught her with her eyes open. So the, the evidence, uh, again, 
in, in your life is much more than randomized controlled trials. It has to do with the science, what we know, what we don't know, but also what you see with your patients. And you, you know, you started out, you shared a story of your own exposure to chiropractic and um, different concepts from people that had rheumatoid arthropathies to a variety of things. And what would you say if you could chronicle your life experience with patients? Uh, have you had a, a majority musculoskeletal type of influence on people's lives or it has it been autonomic as you started out yourself? Or is it, has it been neocortical? Has it been psychological? Has it been a, a bunch of the whole thing? What would you say if you could chronicle your, your journey as a, as a chiropractor and your service to humankind is the type of patient that you have seen throughout your life? Yes. Well, you know, CMCC, when I went to it, was a naturopathic as well as chiropractic college. So I had four hours every Thursday afternoon for four years in naturopathy. So I, I was a mixer on graduating, right? I had a very broad, broad approach to what I would do for a patient, not just do manipulation. However, the manipulation I discovered had to be way more specific than what I had been taught to get the neurological effects, right? If you can do get a crack and you won't see the patient flush or anything happen, and they'll come back in the next time and they'll say, well, not much happened, right? Well, when they go out the door from a manipulation that I was trying to achieve, they, they always knew something happened because I got onto their nervous system. And thanks to Dean Homewood, chiropractic was all about affecting the nervous system. And I didn't even know it was for low back pain. I thought that's what we were trying to do. And I made my studies trying to develop manipulations that could get a neurobiological response. And so uh, that's kind of what I did. And that's what got to the Olympic, the first Canadian chiropractor to be six weeks with an Olympic team. I treated three tendinitis of the knee with lumbar manipulation and never touched their knees right? because I was trying to affect the sympathetic lumbar ganglion chain that I felt was facilitated because they'd been to all kinds of physios and done all kinds of treatment and hadn't got better and they weren't going to go to Los Angeles. And I adjusted their lumbars and in three weeks the tendinitis is cleared up in all three of them and all three of them competed. So I directed my manipulation to try and reduce the sympathetic facilitation if that's what was involved. Now some sprains, strains, things, they're just their own thing and you just treat them as their own thing. But if it becomes chronic, like a chronic tendinitis, right, then there, in my opinion, has to be facilitated sympathetics. And then I read Bosbaum and Levine in the early 70s, and they found out that norepinephrine was being released by the sympathetic nerves that caused the mast cells to release PGE2 that drove chronic inflammation. And they took rabbits and dogs and cut the sympathetics to the arthritic knees and the knees all and they were doing sympathectomies in the stomach to help clear up ulcers. So there was a lot of evidence. And the trick is, and Dr. Uh, Iingen and uh, Budgel are, tr are working on this, trying to uh, show that the, the sympathetics are facilitated by mechanical dysfunction of the spine. And they've actually harvested that norepinephrine before a manipulation and after, and now they have to do it in a, in a symptom population and see whether or not that's really what we're doing. But there's evidence 
that that's probably what we're doing. And that's kind of what I've been going on is probable evidence. You know, I often tell the story, there's no study to prove that a hole in a bucket causes it not to hold water. <laughs> right? There's not one study. But we all know if there's a hole in the bucket, you can't fill it with water. Sometimes you just have to ignore the RCT philosophy and you have to go with experience. Now, when I started, you know, practicing chiropractic, and that's over, that's over four decades ago, there was no evidence for anything. And when you started, much longer than that, I mean, it's almost been 60 years for you, right? The, yeah, um, 60. Yeah, uh, there was no evidence. The, the only evidence was that if something was wrong with you, and it could have been an earache, it could have been cough, it could be a rheumatoid uh, arthritis, it could be rheumatic fever, that sometimes people go to the chiropractor and get better. So when I started, that was, there was no evidence. And as a consequence, a lot of the things that we did were based upon not really beliefs, but on seeing things that happen and learning how to do it. So what do you think is happening with the profession now? We have a lot of evidence for a minimal amount of things, as with all of medicine. Where do we go? Do we, do we just stay in, in the area where there's evidence or we do the things that chiropractors have done before and see what happens in the treatment of a variety of other conditions? Research is very expensive and a lot of research models don't fall into a, into a placebo-controlled, randomized clinical yeah. trial paradigm. You can't get the placebo, and then there might not be equipoise to put people in an individual control. Where do we go? What do you think is going to happen? Well, first of all, we have to get rid of RCT philosophy and go to pragmatic studies. And if we set up a pragmatic study to see whether or not we help constipation or whatever. It, it then behooves somebody to figure out how that happened. But first of all, we have to establish that it happens in a reasonable number of cases, right? And it doesn't matter if we do a cervical or a thoracic or give vitamins or do whatever. That's what we do. So you can't RCT remove everything, take out under 18, take out asthmatics, take out diabetics, take out this, take out that. I have to see all those patients that have back pain. So as far as I'm concerned, a lot of our CTs are gorilla in the cage research. If you did gorilla in the cage research about behavior of a gorilla, and then you tried to convince the world that that's how gorillas behave in the jungle, and nobody would listen to you. And they take cervical manipulation two times or one time and see if it cleared up migraine headaches. Well, migraine headaches for me is a six month job. I have to treat people regularly and slowly reduce the intervals between until I get to a month. And then if I can keep them migraine free on a monthly visit, for another six or eight months, then I probably can say I've done a really good job. But you know, they're they're doing they're they're comparing what we don't do, and they're trying to convince young carpers that we shouldn't be doing it. Cervical manipulation for the patient with headache. Okay, so now they take a patient with a headache and they don't tell you whether their ankle function is normal or their big toe moves properly when they walk, do their knees function, do their hips function, cervical spine. So why is it we, we're doing these studies with isolating manipulation at the place where the pain is supposed to be coming from, and we're not looking at the kinematic chain that the manipulation really should be dealing with, that is going to cause a change in the cervical spine. I still can't get that across to colleges. They're still teaching cervical manipulation for neck pain, low back manipulation for low back pain, 
nobody's looking at the kinematic chain, which is the biomechanical truth. Yeah, it's, it's marvelous and frustrating. With the studies that we have ongoing uh, with manipulation, and you know, we've got a small world and we basically know who can sink a ball from the center line. Uh, we know who's a good adjuster, we know who's not. What do you think about some of the studies of manipulation in chiropractic? And uh, are, we, are we putting our best foot forward? Are we, are we getting the Olympians in there doing the manipulations? Are we getting the superstars? Or are we getting people that maybe uh, don't have a great patient following? Who's doing it? How valid is our research? And how can we make it more robust? In other words, if we're gonna study manipulation, there are some people that are pretty good adjusters out there that probably haven't been across the threshold of a college in a, in a long period of time. What do you think about the, the quality of the therapy? Somebody has been doing it for 10 years or working maybe in an individual clinic, but are they, do they have the skills necessary to measure the things that they're trying to measure? Well, that's an interesting question. And uh, Kim Ross showed that we can't specifically adjust anything. That when we hear one crack, we've, we're probably gapping three or four joints, right? That's simultaneous. So our ears hear one crack, but there's four, right? It's more important the direction of the corrections and how many around the axes of rotation are corrected in that area that's dysfunctional. And yeah. that's not being done. So in my opinion, a lot of the so-called research is, is amateurs, in my opinion, they're very good at doing one direction, getting one crack, but are they clearing out function and getting function back into the motion units. And we don't know that. And then a lot of studies say SMT, and it doesn't describe what the SMT is. And you know, there's, there's so many gaps in what is being called good research, RCTs. And there's too many flaws, in my opinion, because they're not looking at the kinematic chain, and you can't isolate out L5, S1 for a low back pain or thracolumbar junction or wherever it is you want to be RCTing because the very fact an RCT has to remove all the variables is destroys it right away for us. And Rand has come to the conclusion that it has to be a pragmatic study and then work backwards. Yeah, it, it's exciting. Well, I tell you, Len, I mean, I can speak to you for, for hours, and I think we should schedule uh, some talks. We also want to talk about the videos that you have, the manipulation videos, the adjustment videos, training videos, things that are basically free. I mean, the, the, the cost is negligible, good service for people, um, and how people can get those things from you. Well, it's at www dot chiropractic mentor dot com and uh, they join for seven dollars and ninety five cents a month and they can watch three hours of video i'll send them a, an email that gives them a 56 page printout of all the, the palpations and manipulations they can highlight what they don't know and they can start learning it it'll take months and months but at the end of a certain length of time, instead of doing the same thing over and over again, they will be becoming masters of manipulation and palpation. They'll be dealing with the whole kinematic chain. So they're gonna have a lot more visits because they'll be spending months on the ankle, the foot, the hip, the sacroiliac, and they'll be doing lots and lots of treatments so they're uh, busyness will go up and they'll be way more happy with what they're doing because they'll see these developments occurring and then when they get to dealing with the spine they'll see that 
it won't come back the same way three days later because it'll start to change. And then they'll get the concept they're changing tissue responses, which is the SAID response, and tissues become more elastic. They don't try and, try and take up calcium. They try and become elastic. The connections with the brain, the recruitment order of muscles, and now we're finding out that there's actually cortical changes and the neuroplastic changes that chronic pain have created actually reverse in six or eight months. And so it's super exciting. It's the greatest time to be a chiropractor. If only they would learn to do the manipulation effectively in the kinematic chain. I think so it's great. But I, but I think you really have to enforce it because, I mean, you're, um, you're making money hand over foot with that seven bucks that they're, they're paying. <laughs> I mean, and I think people, when they listen, they go like, really? Like, what am I going to get for the seven bucks? And they're getting a whole load. And it's pretty obvious why you're doing it. It's, I mean, the seven bucks is... I'm 81. I've like been stamp for that. 60 years. I yeah. just want them to know how to do it. It's, it's a wonderful gift. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, gift. It's inspirational. Well, you know, we just haven't even cracked the surface of the things that you and I should be talking about. So what I'd like to do is just set up more of a regular uh, time that we can talk and go over uh, some issues. And I'd like to share with you some of the things that, that I'm doing and with my colleagues. Um, present. Well, what you're doing is phenomenal. Oh, well, thanks. It's thanks. Incredible. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty where we have to get to, but, you know, I can't even get them off base <laughs> one. Oh, man, I tell you, it's really great. But, Len, I, you know, um, time goes by so very, very quickly, and you have been practicing for over half of the time of the profession. I'm almost there as well, and, and it just, it's, it's a blink, and... Yeah. I agree with you. I think this is a wonderful time to be a chiropractor. We have been raised with doom and gloom. And um, it's a sad story when we look at all the beautiful things that are happening for, for chiropractors. I think that you're concerned and I'm concerned of skill levels, uh, of changing of paradigms. And at the end of the day, manipulation is a pretty incredible understood gift uh, that can be learned, and you've certainly done it, you know, with uh, demonstration and sacrifice. People can learn how to do this, and I'd like to explore that more, um, and I think that we have a lot to, to talk about, so let's schedule some more of these, and I just love it. I mean, I can sit and talk yeah. to you for forever in a day. Fred, I, uh, or Ted, I really, uh, I really appreciate that you've gone to the trouble to set up this interview and uh, help uh, people understand what it is we're about. And maybe uh, the paradigm was shifting. You know, at one stage that we were, MPI was giving 300 seminars a year and we were shifting it like crazy. And then greed took over and I had to, and uh, <clears throat> changes going on that should be going on. We're locked up again. Yeah, and you know, you hit it with uh, greed and opportunity and betrayal and uh, all of these things. That's a part of the history. And I think we'd like to talk about that and get a, get a good picture so people can understand um, perseverance that you can keep on going in spite of all of the nonsense and the good people, the bad people. Good people are still around. Bad people largely yeah. filter down, you know. Take good care. I look forward to seeing you again in person, yeah. which is always the best. But I want to do more of these, and I want to chronicle a lot of, a lot of things. And we have so many people. We've got 16,000 uh, alumni in Carrick Institute, and we have our our license from the Florida Department of Education to give a master's degree. And we're going through regional and national accreditation on that and different research are clinical. Oh, it's fantastic what you've done. Oh, it's absolutely fantastic what you've done. <laughs> I really, really appreciate you.
That's kind. Okay, dear friend. Well, until next time, you yeah. take good care, and we'll be seeing you soon. Right, and with a new computer. Yes, we are. See I you know. later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.